This video is available in both DVD and online formats, YouTube, etc. It is your video, so please use it to suit your needs. Feel free to pause, rewind, and practice the techniques at your leisure. In Safe Hands with the Scottish Centre for Personal Safety. My name is Alan Bell. I'm the founder of the Scottish Centre for Personal Safety. We're a charity that provides personal safety, conflict resolution, and practical self-defence training throughout the whole of Scotland and the UK. We're working in conjunction with Deaf Blind Scotland for this video to teach you the law regarding self-defence, reasonable use of force, and some practical self-defence skills. And hopefully, this will increase your self-confidence and decrease any anxiety you have and any fear you may have about being attacked. So come and join us. The law regarding the use of force in Scotland and Ireland may be worded slightly differently, but they all stem from English law. Section 3, paragraph 1 of the Criminal Law Act 1967 states, A person may use such force as is reasonable in the circumstances and prevention of a crime, or in effecting or assisting in a lawful arrest of offenders or suspected persons unlawfully at large. You're allowed to use such force as is reasonably necessary to defend yourself, defend others, protect your property, and to make a citizen's arrest. The interpretation of such force used depends upon the gravity of the crime being prevented, whether it was possible to prevent it by non-violent means, whether you were willing to try those means first, and the relative strength of the parties involved. To make the law clearer, I'm going to place you in a cafe scenario. There's only one way in and one way out, and the cafe is too narrow to move about much. There are hardly any other people in the cafe. A man walks in and, looking right at you, shouts, I'm going to knock your block off. With clenched fists, he approaches you and he punches you in the jaw. He walks away. Can you chase after him and defend yourself? Well, if you did, you may be able to argue that you're making a citizen's arrest, but it's likely that the courts will deem your actions to be an assault. It can't be self-defence because the man was walking away from you, so you've nothing to defend yourself against. A judge or a procurator fiscal will usually ask, did you feel threatened? And if you can prove that you did, you have the right to defend yourself. If you can't prove this, or the judge or procurator fiscal does not think that you could have felt threatened, it's not self-defence. So let's change the scenario slightly. Same cafe, same man, he still shouts, I'm going to knock your block off. With clenched fists, he approaches you and he punches you in the jaw, but this time... He shouts, there's more where that came from. He raises his hand to strike again. Now can you defend yourself? Did you feel threatened? Yes, you can defend yourself now. So in the eyes of the law, you need to wait until your attacker strikes you before you can defend yourself, right? Wrong. You're allowed to defend yourself if you feel threatened and there's no other means of escape and you try to prevent the attack by non-violent means first, before you defend yourself. So the question is, when did you feel threatened? Same cafe, same man. He shouts aggressively, I'm going to knock your block off. And as he storms towards you, you raise your arms in a defensive pose, and you shout, get back, at the top of your voice. He still comes at you, and you were forced to defend yourself. You struck first. He's not touched you yet, but his intention to strike you made you feel threatened. And, after trying to stop him by non-violent means failed, you were forced to strike him and stop the attack. That's self-defence. Hopefully this example has helped clarify when you can and cannot defend yourself, and by association, when you can and cannot defend others. To help explain the relative strength of the parties involved, let me introduce you to Boris and Doris. Boris is a rather large, muscle-bound male, while Doris is a small, frail, 
elderly lady. Now, if Doris decided to attack Boris, what can Boris do to defend himself? Well, as her blows would be relatively ineffectual, Boris could simply put his hand in Doris's head and hold her back. What if the roles were reversed then? What if Boris decided to attack Doris? Well, Doris might not get very far defending herself with just her hands and her feet, so she might have to use an improvised weapon, such as her umbrella. In this section, we're going to be talking about defensive stance and voice control. So from a defensive stance point of view, there's no point standing with your body straight onto your attacker and your legs shoulder width apart, because if your attacker pushes you, you'll fall back. The best way to defensive stance is for your left foot forward, your right foot back. Your left foot should be pointing at 12 o'clock and your right foot about 2 o'clock. With your knees slightly bent, your hands up and your palms open. And that's your defensive stance. So once you're in your defensive stance, we're going to look at your voice control. How you can project your voice so your attacker may think twice about possibly attacking you. If you can think about the little dog barking against the big dog, the big dog could just swat the little dog quite easily. But the little dog, because the ferocity of his bark, scares the big dog and he thinks twice about it. And that's what you have to do. It's kind of scare your attacker. So defensive, the defensive stance is one thing. The voice control is probably the next most important thing. So when we shout this out, we're going to shout get back. Now get back is a police term. It's used by police when they withdraw their batons before they have to use defensively. It's the same with you. You shout get back. If it ever has to go to law, to court, they'll understand it's a defensive term. And it can't be confused with anything else. If you shout get off, it may be confused with something else off. So get back is the term we're going to use. When you shout it, you're going to use a lot of aggression, your voice as I said before, and you're going to do it as much gusto as possible. It's as loud as possible. So from here, you're going to shout, GET BACK! And hopefully that will put your attacker off. There are four reasons for doing this. Number one, as we've said already, it complies with the law. It's your non-violent means when it comes to the law. You could have run away, but if you can't run away, use your voice. The second thing is, if you shout loud enough, hopefully, you'll get witnesses. People will turn around, and that's important, because if you're about to strike someone defensively, it's important you know that you're doing this defensively, that you're not attacking them. So if they can turn around now, rather than when a scuffle starts, they will see that you've shouted get back, and they'll see the person attacking you, and you're defending yourself. So that's what we're looking for. There are now two reasons for it as well. The third reason, is how it makes your attacker feel. As I mentioned at the beginning there, if you can do this aggressively, with a bit of gusto, your attacker might think twice about who they're up against. Because they're actually looking for a vulnerable person. They're looking for an easy target. So when you shout out, you're no longer that vulnerable, easy target. You're basically saying, I'm going to put up a fight here. And that's good. And the last reason is how it makes you feel. You're going to feel afraid. You're going to feel adrenaline going into your body and you'll feel a little bit shaky when this all kicks off. Particularly if there's a lot of aggro and verbalisation happening beforehand. So what you want to do in that case is take control of the situation and shout out. If you think of adrenaline in your body as like a pressure kettle, it builds up. Now if you do any kind of adrenaline sports like bungee jumping or parachuting, you tend to shout out before you jump. Whether it's Geronimo or bungee. Why do you do that? Why not just say it in your head? By shouting out, it relieves some of that pressure. And it brings you back down so you can control what's happening next. And it means the power you put into a strike is a lot higher. So for that reason, for those four reasons, this is why we do voice control. Where to strike your attacker? The T-Zone. Let me introduce you to Bob here. Bob is B-O-B, -B, Body Opponent Bag. And we use Bob to demonstrate the most efficient way to strike an attacker. And we call this the T-Zone. 
The T-zone is basically from one ear, across the eyes and the bridge of the nose, to the other ear, and from the bridge of the nose, right down to the groin. A capital T. Now, if you're fully sighted, you can see exactly what I've just said there. If you have visual impairment, it'll be more tactile. You'll be able to feel where this is in your attacker. But let me explain bit by bit why this is so effective. We start off with the ears. What's the best way of striking an ear? Some people think maybe you should twist it, pull it, but that's not the best way. The best way is to slap the ear. Now when I say slap, I don't mean like a Hollywood slap where it's a flat hand across the face or across the ear. Our slap is to cup the hand. Picture yourself as if you're cupping water and you've got some water in your hand there. Only this time, because there's no water, you just get air. When that air strikes a flat surface, it goes inside the surface. So if it was the neck area and it hits in, you'll find it does some damage to the nerves in the neck, which can be effective. But in this case, with the ear, if you do a slap to the ear with a cupped hand, it fires that air into the eardrum, right the way along to the end, and hopefully pops an eardrum. Technically what you're doing is not really to cause that amount of damage, but if it does, and your attacker's then put off balance, that can be a bonus. If it doesn't, he'll still be holding his ear as you run away. The beauty of this though is, if your attacker grabs you and he's got a hold of you, you can do the same move, but there's no point in striking one ear, you may as well do two. So with two hands, you would strike both ears, causing maximum damage, allowing you then to escape. Everything we teach you is one or two moves to then escape. Let's move on to the eyes. As you come round to the eye area, when we ask people what do you do with the eyes, a lot of people think about poking the eye with a single finger. Um, and that's not ideal either. It's a very small point of the eye and a very small finger. So to get in there, it's quite technical. Particularly if you've got a visual impairment. So again, we're going to look at what happens if you've been grabbed. You can use your thumbs, find the eye sockets, and you'll find that your thumbs will fall into them quite easy. And you push your thumbs into the eyeball sockets. Now your attacker's brain will realise there's only enough space in that eyeball socket for his eyeball. Not for your thumb as well. So when you push your thumbs into the eyeball socket, he will automatically pull his head back. It's a defensive mechanism for his body to save his eyes. The only time this wouldn't work is if your attacker is on drugs, if he's quite high in certain types of drugs. Sometimes that brain signal doesn't go to his brain. He doesn't realise this. But it will still work because as you push into the eyes, if he doesn't move his head back, then exactly what you thought might happen will happen. Your thumb takes the place of his eyeball. His eyeball will pop out, not like the movies where it rolls about on the floor, but it will hang by the optic nerve on his cheek. And if you can think of what that will do to himself, when he's about to attack you, he's now got one eye looking at you and one eye looking at the floor, you're going to shock, which means he can't continue the attack and you can escape. So either way, this will work. We're not planning to do a lot of damage to him, but if this person is aggressive and he's not going to let you go and he's high on drugs, it will still work. And this technique gives you the confidence to know it will work. So thumbs in. The way I look at it though is, if you're really been at the stage where you've been grabbed and potentially about to get hit, you could use that ear slap, you could use those eyes, or you could do a combination of both. <laughs> slap the ears, find the eye sockets, push in hard and push them away. By the time your attacker managed to open his eyes and pull his ears away, you've hopefully gone. It's quite a devastating move. So from the top part of the tee, we move down to the main body of the tee. The bridge of the nose. The nose is quite a delicate area. If you ever bumped your nose, your eyes water quite easy. Um, it can break quite easy as well. If we strike the nose, it's going to be quite devastating for your attacker. So what you're looking for is an open palm. Remember we had a defensive stance with our palms open. We're going to use the bottom part of our palm to strike in towards your attacker's nose area. Again, with as much force as we can, and you're hoping that it will get him his eyes closed, and you can get away. Usually your attack will fall backwards. If he's still there, you can drag your hands down and you'll find that your fingers will automatically fall into his eyeball sockets and you're back to your fingers in his eyes again. 
so it can have a double impact. So the nose is really good. The lips. You could strike the lips, you can miss the nose completely and strike the lips, or you could just aim for the lips, or the head area, and strike in there. The lips are just little sacks of blood. That's all they are. So when you strike them, if you picture a balloon and you squeeze one end, it bursts at the other end. It's the same with the lips. You strike in, they burst quite easy. Now if you ever watch amateur boxing, um, you'll find that as boxers box away and they get cut, sometimes they don't respond straight away. Sometimes after about 30 seconds, they wipe their glove against their face, they realise there's blood in the glove and they do a little shake as their body does a quick check to see where it's been hurt. And it's the same with your attacker. If you strike in at the face area, when they taste that blood, their body does a quick check. It may allow you to escape, or it may allow you to follow through with another technique somewhere else in the T-zone. The chin. Now, a lot of people think that the chin isn't a good place to strike someone because it's quite a solid bone. But it's actually one of the best places. If you think of boxers, boxers will go in for a knockout punch and will strike a punch into the chin area. Do you think it knocks them out because it rattles the brain and the head's moved about? But it's not. The chin is really a floating bone. It's part of the jaw. And behind the jawbone is a little dimple. You can actually feel it in your own ears. There's a little dimple just behind there. If you push that dimple area, it's uncomfortable in your own ears. But if someone does it to you, it's extremely painful. It's full of nerve endings. And because of that, if you strike with an open palm into the chin area, it forces the jaw going back into this little dimple of nerve endings and the pain's so intense it will hopefully knock your attacker out. So it's an extremely effective way of going from a defensive stance to striking in and potentially knocking out your attacker before he does any damage to you. As we move further down, we've got the throat area. Now the throat itself, if you go to martial arts at all or you've done any martial arts, any boxing, you never go for the throat because it's extremely dangerous. A strike to the throat could cause swelling, which could cause the supply of oxygen to be cut off, and could potentially kill your attacker. So they tell you never to go for this. But we teach this because we find it an extremely effective move of disengaging from an attacker. Now we don't want to kill them, so we're not going to teach you to punch your attacker in the throat. What we are going to do is this is a nice soft part of his body. We're going to use a soft part of our body to strike him with to decrease the damage. Between your finger and your thumb is a little web. We're going to strike in with this web into the throat. So again, you've got your open palms. As they come towards you, you can either put your hand on your attacker's chest, very tactile, where nobody is. If you feel pressure as he comes towards you or fear that you're about to be hit, you can slide your hand up and strike in at your attacker's throat area. The bigger angle you can put in, the more devastating it will be. So if you hit straight up, it's one point, hitting straight in the way, at horizontal angle, it'll cause them more damage. But not as much damage as a punch. Now you may be thinking, in that case we never punch. But, this is a self-defence video. If you're in a situation where this person has got a knife, or a weapon of some kind, you feel that your life's in danger, you've been strangled, or heaven forbid, you're on the floor and you may be about to be sexually assaulted. In any of these circumstances where your life is in danger, you can then increase the amount of defence that you do in your technique. And in those circumstances, we would strongly suggest a punch to that throat, because it will stop them, guaranteed. As you move down, the chest area is quite a solid sternum bone here, in the middle of the chest. In the military, we are taught to strike this, because then it could cause the heart to flutter. But in the military, everyone wears uniforms and they're quite thin. In the street, it's slightly different. People wear big padded jackets, biker jackets, um, they may have different layers of fat. Um, so it's not as effective in the street. It's far better to just drop down the tea slightly, just below that sternum, that rigid bone, and you'll find this area here is a diaphragm. If you head into the diaphragm and you'll find as I talk, you can hear a difference in my voice changing as I push in it takes the wind out of your attacker. So again, striking in, you could do an open palm strike, or you could do what we call a hammer fist. You make a fist with your hand, but instead of striking with the knuckles, which may break, you're gonna strike with this paddy part, as if you've got a hammer on your hand. So the paddy part comes in and strikes the attacker and wins them. 
And this can be right the way down in the stomach area. Diaphragm's the best, but if you hit lower down, it's still effective as well. And the last area in the T-zone is the pubic bone area, the groin area. Now, male or female, if you knee into this area, it will do a lot of damage. It's quite painful. But Bob being Bob, he's a male, and therefore we've got his own set of tennis balls for him here. So basically, you can knee into this area. If you are going to knee, we suggest that you hold on to your attacker. If you try and knee without holding on, you might hit off a solid object of the attacker and fall backwards. So to prevent that happening, hold on, balance yourself and knee up. It may take several knees to get the effect because it might hit a leg or something first. So you knee, how do you know it works? Because your attacker will end up bent over and clutching his groin area. Again, male or female. But why we've put the tennis balls on is because if it is a male and you've been attacked and you've been grabbed from behind, you could do another technique. You could do a hammer fist if it was male or female and smack your hammer fist into the groin area. Or you could reach back, your middle finger is going to go back as far back as you can. And by that stage, you should have something in the cup of your hand. And that should be his groin area. As you squeeze the testicles, twist and pull and yank out as hard as you can. And that will do a lot of damage to the attacker and he probably won't be standing there for much longer. And that is your T-zone. Improvised weapons. Improvised weapons are everyday items, some of which can be found in your person, that can be used to repel an attack. Some examples include your keys. These can be held between your thumb and forefinger as if opening a door and can be used to defend yourself in a stabbing motion anywhere in the T-zone of your attacker. Similarly, a folded umbrella, a rolled up magazine and a pen are all everyday objects that can be used to protect yourself in a stabbing motion anywhere in the T-zone of your attacker. A hairbrush can be used in the same stabbing motion. However, if you hold the handle and drag the bristles of the brush down your attacker's face, you'll not only fend them off, but make it easy for the police to identify your attacker, both by the scratches in his face and from the DNA from his skin left in your hairbrush. A comb can also be used as an improvised weapon, but they can be too brittle and flimsy to use in a stabbing motion. They can, however, be used in a slashing motion in the head area of your attacker. Pressurised aerosol cans, such as deodorants or hairsprays, make ideal improvised weapons. Spraying an attacker's face with an aerosol will not only result in pain, but may also cause temporary blindness, allowing you to escape. Mobility aids such as walking sticks or white canes also make excellent improvised weapons. Not only do they aid in your defence, but are more likely to garner help from passers-by should they see you being attacked. This list is not exhaustive. Remember, an improvised weapon is an everyday object, which you would legitimately have on your person or to hand and can be adapted for use as a weapon to defend yourself. They are only to be used if you're being attacked. Similarly, there are many items for sale in the UK which are marketed as self-defense accessories. Please be aware that these are not improvised weapons. They may look innocuous at first glance, taking the guise of key fobs, pens or finger rings, but they're designed to cause harm. And as such, if you're found in possession of any such item, you will more than likely be charged with carrying an offensive weapon. Items such as stun guns, pepper spray and knuckle dusters are also illegal in this country and you could face a heavy fine and be sentenced to jail just for possessing them. In this section, we're going to teach you five practical self-defense techniques. These are a wrist grab breakaway, a clothing grab breakaway, the rhino, a stranglehold release, and cane defense. Each of these lessons are presented to you in two parts, demonstration and breakdown. 
The demonstration section will show you the move in real time, while the breakdown part will show you how the move is performed in a step-by-step -step lesson. To help illustrate each of these steps, we will pause the action and render our attacker in red and our defender in blue. Number 1. Risk Grab Breakaway Demonstration Let go! Breakdown When somebody grabs your wrist, the first thing you should do is loudly and firmly tell them to let go. This lets them know that you're not happy with the situation as well as attracting witnesses and the other benefits of using your voice detailed earlier in this video. As a wrist grab is usually a control method used by an aggressor, they will more than likely yank your arm causing you to be pulled forward. Even if this doesn't happen, whichever wrist is being grabbed, step forward with the opposite leg. So if your right arm is grabbed in the case of this scenario, stand with your left foot forward and your right foot back. This will enable you to use the momentum of your body twisting against your attacker. If they don't let go, look or feel for where the space is in their grip, between their thumb and forefinger. This is the weak point in their grip. Take a note of where this point is, as this will dictate the direction by which your arm will escape the grasp. You're going to free your wrist by swinging it through the weak point in your attacker's grip. The hand of your grab wrist should form a fist, and you'll then bring your opposite free hand around to grab your fist. Now you're in a good position to use the strength of both arms, plus the twisting of your body to break free of your attacker's grasp. In a quick motion, similar to a baseball bat swing, swing your arms in the direction of the weak point in your attacker's grip, turning your whole body at the waist as you do so. Your upper body and hips will provide added momentum rather than simply relying on the strength of your arms, making this a very powerful technique. Now that you've broken free, either return your swing to strike your attacker with your double fists if they lunge towards you, or bring your hands around to form a defensive stance and in a loud voice tell your attacker to get back. Remember, you're breaking free through the weakest point of your attacker's grip. So if this weak point is facing up, you'll swing your arms upward. If it's facing down, you'll swing your arms downward. And in the likely event that your attacker has grasped both of your wrists with both of his hands, kick him in the shins or knee him in the groin. Similarly, if for whatever reason the weakest link breakaway fails, you can always resort to striking your attacker anywhere in the T-zone to aid your escape. Here's the wrist grab breakaway at full speed once again. Let go. Number 2. Clothing grab breakaway. Before explaining this technique, I want to describe to you what we like to refer to as the Batman move. The Batman move is where you tuck your chin down and swing your arm over towards your opposite shoulder, keeping your elbow high. It resembles Batman covering his face with his cape, hence the name. It not only protects your head against a punch, but also enables you to perform various self-defense techniques involving grabbing or striking your attacker's hand during a clothing grab. Demonstration Breakdown. As soon as you feel threatened, adopt your defensive stance and shout, get back. If they grab your clothing, firmly tell your attacker to let go, but be aware that you will also need to protect your head in case your attacker punches you with your free hand. To do this, grab the wrist of the arm that has grabbed you and push your attacker's hand against your body. Then perform a Batman move with your free hand, 
swing your fist towards your attacker's grabbing hand. As you swing your arm, ensure that you twist your body from the waist to add momentum and power to your strike. Make a fist and then project the knuckle on your middle finger out beyond the others and strike the back of the attacker's hand in a quick stabbing motion. As you'll be striking the small thin bones in the back of your attacker's hand, this will obviously cause them a great deal of pain and should force them to release their grip. Here is an illustration of how your hand should look for this strike. Note the knuckle of the middle finger is projecting beyond the others. The middle finger is supported by the thumb and adjacent fingers. Now when you strike the attacker's hand, you are channeling all the power of your swing and upper body momentum through that one knuckle. This strike should deliver enough pain to force your attacker to let go of your clothing. But what if they don't let go? In this instance, let go of your attacker's wrist with your free hand and place it on top of your striking hand as it comes to rest in the back of your attacker's hand. Now press down hard with that hand, forcing your knuckle into your attacker's hand, which is against your body. This will multiply the force of impact into your attacker's hand. Drag your knuckle horizontally along the bones on the back of your attacker's hand, and as these little hand bones painfully separate, your attacker will be quick to let you go. If for whatever reason this clothing grab breakaway does not work, you can always follow through by striking your attacker anywhere in the T-zone to aid your escape. Here is the clothing grab breakaway at full speed once again. Number three, the Rhino. The Rhino allows you to protect your head against incoming blows, while enabling you to respond with reasonable force if necessary. There are three different versions of the Rhino. Number one, the standard Rhino. From your defensive stance, bend your left arm at the elbow and place your left hand behind your head, holding your neck. Keep your left forearm tight against the side of your head and the point of your elbow level with your eyes. Keep your right arm extended, but shrug your right shoulder, bring it up to cover your right ear. Your head is now protected against incoming blows, particularly the most common, which is a roundhouse punch from a right-handed attacker. As this blow would land on the left side of your head, this is where we have your left elbow pointing forward like a rhino horn. Although defensive and designed to protect your head, the rhino can also be used to strike your attacker, as we will soon demonstrate. Number two, the double rhino. With the double rhino, your right arm mirrors your left arm to form two rhino horns. This is particularly useful if facing multiple attackers. Number three, the half rhino. As with the standard rhino, the half rhino sees the left elbow raised to form a rhino horn. With the half rhino, however, the right arm, instead of being extended, is brought around in the front of your forehead so that your right forearm is on your forehead and your right hand is grasping your left forearm. This offers even greater protection against incoming blows. Demonstration of the standard rhino. Breakdown. If confronted by an aggressor, adopt your defensive stance and shout, get back. If they continue their advance, change your defensive stance to form a standard rhino or one of the other two rhinos. At this point, your left elbow should be pointing towards your attacker. You can use your free right hand to feel if the attacker enters your personal space. If this occurs, step forward in a lunging motion with your front left foot and drive your rhino horn into the attacker's head or chest. This simple lunge forward delivers the force of your entire body moving forward, combined with the force of your attacker moving towards you, and centers this force through the point of your elbow or rhino horn. It is devastatingly effective and has in the past broken one of our instructor's ribs, even through his body armor chest padding. If, for whatever reason, this rhino strike does not incapacitate your attacker, you can always follow through by striking them anywhere in the T-zone
to aid your escape. Here's the rhino again at full speed. Number 4, Superman Stranglehold Release. Demonstration. Oi! Breakdown. As before, if confronted by an aggressor, adopt a defensive stance and shout, get back. But often a stranglehold comes on quickly and without much warning, so you may not get a chance to do this. If your attacker has his hands around your neck in a stranglehold, you may be forced backwards by this pressure. Either way, stand with one foot back, the other forward. You can start your escape with a simple shrug of the shoulders. This will trap your attacker's hands in place, as well as releasing some pressure from your windpipe. Now raise both your arms straight up so that your biceps are pressed against your ears. Think how Superman looks as he flies through the air. Or if it helps, grab both hands together as if pulling a rope above your head. Be sure to keep your arms tight against your head and your biceps as close to your head as possible. Now, in a quick but deliberate motion, turn your body away from the attacker in the direction of your back foot. In this scenario, the defender's left foot is to the rear, so the defender will turn to the left, utilising the momentum of their whole body twisting at the waist against their attacker. Your attacker will be pulled forward and his wrist will be locked and bent as you turn, causing him to let go of your neck. Once you have turned to be side on to your attacker, you can then swing your arms back again, smashing your double fists or your elbow into your attacker's face. Please note, it is not the downward force of your arms being lowered that will break your attacker's hold on you, but the turning of your body, which will exert torque on his wrists. If, for whatever reason, you don't land a suitable blow to your attacker once free, strike out again anywhere in the T-zone and make your escape. Here is a Superman Stranglehold release at full speed once again. Oi. Number 5. Cane Defence If you're ever threatened while holding your cane, you would recommend that you keep a hold of it rather than dropping it. Your cane may serve not only as an improvised weapon, but may encourage passers-by to come to your assistance. There are two versions of cane defence, one for when the attacker tries to pull your cane from you and one for when the attacker pushes the cane into you. Cane defence, attacker pulls. Demonstration. You talk to me! Get back! You say that! Get back! Get back! Get back! Get back! Get back! Get back! Breakdown. If you're threatened while you're out using your cane, go to your defensive stance and tell the attacker in a bold voice to get back. The defensive stance with a cane in hand is very similar to the version without. As usual, stand with your feet shoulder width apart, left foot forward pointing at the 12 o'clock position and your right foot back pointing at the 2 o'clock position. Your knees should be slightly bent, your arms outstretched, but this time, instead of presenting your attacker with open palms, Hold your cane out horizontally as a physical barrier to your personal space. Your hands should be shoulder width apart so that there is a reasonable amount of space between them. This ensures you have a strong grip and also offers the attacker an open space if they decide to make a grab for your cane. If the attacker decides to wrench the cane from your grip, do not resist. Instead, as you are pulled, you are going to keep his momentum moving and step forward, using your cane to drive him away from you. In the scenario shown, as the attacker pulls the cane, the defender is pulled forward and steps forward with his right back leg. As he does so, he pivots his cane from a horizontal position through a forward vertical arc, much like paddling a kayak. Your aim is to strike the attacker with your cane, throwing your attacker off balance in doing so and forcing him to release his grip on your cane. As before, if this does not work, follow through by letting go of your cane with one hand and use this free hand to strike your attacker anywhere in the T-zone. Here is the cane defence when attacker pulls at full speed once again. You talk to me! Get back! You say that! Get back! Get back! Get back! Get back! Cane defence, attacker pushes. Demonstration. You talk to me! Get back! You 
Breakdown. Having detected a threat, you once again adopt a defensive stance and shout, get back. But this time your attacker grabs your cane, intending to push you off balance or shove you into harm's way. As your attacker charges forward into your cane, do not resist. Instead, you're going to flow with his forward pushing momentum. Step backward as he pushes and use your cane to throw him away from you. In the scenario shown, as the attacker pushes the cane, the defender steps backward with his front left leg. As he does so, he pivots his cane from a horizontal position through a forward vertical arc, again like paddling a kayak. Your aim is to strike the attacker with your cane as he passes you, throwing your attacker off balance in doing so and forcing him to release his grip on your cane. As before, if this doesn't work, follow through by letting go of your cane with one hand and use his free hand to strike the attacker anywhere in the T-zone. Here is the cane defence where an attacker pushes at full speed once again. You talk to me! Get back! You talk to me! Get back! Get back! Get back! Get back! Closing words and credits. Thank you for watching this video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. And more importantly, hopefully, the techniques that you've learned, you'll never have to use. It's important to stress though, that the techniques we have shown you are our basic self-defense techniques. If you want to learn more, you can look at our website, which is www.scotcps.org.uk. Or you can look at our social media pages, both Facebook and Instagram is forward slash Scott CPS and Twitter is forward slash Scott underscore CPS. So from everyone here at the Scottish Centre for Personal Safety and from Deafblind Scotland, thank you for watching. Stay safe. Many thanks to all of the Scottish Centre for Personal Safety volunteers who took part in making this video. Most of the defender roles were played by the charity's registered blind personal safety self-defense instructors. Credits for Risk Grab Breakaway, Laura Grant and Deirdre Oakley. Credits for Clothing Grab Breakaway, Josh Bell and Christine McCook. Credits for The Rhino, John Divers and Yvette Robertson. Credits for Stranglehold Release, David Calder and Norma Bailey. And credits for Kane Defence, David Bell and David Black. And myself, Alan Bell. Special thanks to registered blind artist Michael McAllister for illustrating the law section. Very special thanks for interpreting this video. in partnership with DeafBlind Scotland and kindly funded by Alliance Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland produced by Trinity Studios The Scottish Centre for Personal Safety Copyright 2019